Hi, and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979. Lots of people who watch this channel want to learn a bit about machine language or assembly language. If you spend any time reading about computers, somewhere within the first few minutes, you'll inevitably come across someone saying, computers think in zeros and ones, or sometimes computers speak in zeros and ones. What does this mean? Is it really true? We're going to talk about this today, and hopefully, when we're done, the answer will help you understand what a machine language instruction really is. The answer to does a computer think in zeros and ones is not really. Or rather, computers operate using things we can think of as zeros and ones, but they don't have to. Although we can think of zeros and ones as the medium of the brain of a digital computer, they aren't essential to the concept of a computer. Saying a computer thinks in zeros and ones is sort of like saying a human brain thinks in atoms. It's technically true, but it's the wrong abstraction to use to understand what's actually happening. First, I want to be clear that I'm not going to go for the easy gotcha answer. Digital circuits are, on the micro level, carrying around electrical voltages. So a cute but useless answer to this question is, well, computers really think in voltages, which are sort of analog, and we treat around five volts as one and around zero volts as zero, so calling these zeros and ones is wrong. That answer isn't helpful. So for now, let's just agree that around five volts and around zero volts do in fact mean 1 and 0 for purposes of this video. To illustrate this video, I'm going to use the Hack CPU. Now, this was designed by Noam Neeson and Shimon Shokin and explained in their book, The Elements of Computing Systems, Building a Computer from First Principles. If you've ever heard of the NAND to Tetris course, this is the textbook it uses, and it is great. I'm using the Hack CPU because it's small, and because if you want to experiment with it yourself, you can get this book and build it yourself to see how it works. In the coming weeks, I'll be going through some parts of the book to go into detail about how exactly it all fits together. A simplified model of a computer is that it reads a number and then interprets that number as a code or instruction that tells it to do something, usually something very specific. A bunch of those instructions put together make up a machine language program. One of the clever things about the Hack CPU is that in some sense, it only has two instructions called the A instruction and the C instruction. The A instruction does nothing but store a number in a special place in the computer's memory called the A register. The C instruction has a ton of options that let the CPU choose between a lot of different behaviors. In the Hack CPU, if an instruction starts with a zero, it's an A instruction. If it starts with a one, it's a C instruction. So the leftmost bit or piece of information is zero is a code for the concept. The next 15 bits are the data to be put into the A register. And the leftmost bit, again, a bit is a piece of information. If the leftmost bit is a one, it's code for the next few bits are a C instruction. But the key thing I want to get across here is that the computer doesn't know this. We know it. Let's actually simulate an example and see what happens. Here's our CPU. It looks complicated, but we can ignore most of it for right now. We're going to look at just two things here. The instruction, which is over here, and a bit of memory called the A register, which is over here. You can see if we look at the value above the A register, it has a zero in it right now. Let's go over to the instruction and let's change some of the bits that are in it from zero to one. We'll put the value 1001 repeated in this A instruction, which in standard binary coding is the number nine repeated three times. So it's the hex value 0x999. I'm not going to explain hex values right now. Then let's make time go forward 
and watch what happens to our A instruction. I'm going to tick the CPU clock, and we can see the hex value 999 appeared in our A register. When we put this value into the instruction, you'll note that the first bit in the instruction is a zero. That's what tells this CPU that this is an A instruction. The C instruction is similar, but has more structure. Neeson and Schocken break it into three parts, a seven bit number that's used to define what computation is going to happen, a three bit number that indicates where to store the result, and another three bit number that indicates if the CPU should branch or jump to a new place in memory. So let's say we've put in an instruction that says, take the result of the A register. If these three bits here are zero, the result will be thrown away. And as I make time go forward, indeed nothing happens with it. If instead I change these three bits to zero, one, zero, the result from here in the A register should be stored here in the D register. Let's make time go forward. And indeed, there it is. So although we call this machine language, I suggest that language is really a misleading term. I prefer the term machine code. Each machine language instruction really lights up wires in the CPU that make it behave in a certain way. The language part of this has nothing to do with how the CPU thinks. It's a convention agreed upon between the people who design the CPU and the people who are programming it. And returning to our question of zeros and ones, that too is simply another convention. There are other machines that can be programmed with instructions. For example, the Jacquard loom. If there are holes in the card here, the needles can go through making a certain pattern. Otherwise, they're blocked. One can imagine a computer that divides up analog electrical signals into three discrete levels instead of just two. And in fact, the Soviet Union's Setun computer, built in 1958, did just that, operating on ternary logic, trits, instead of binary bits. This logic can, in theory, be extended to any number of bits, or we could build computers using analog circuits with no digital components. In practice, binary digital computers have become universal instead of these other options because for essentially mechanical reasons, they're easier to build and understand, not because ones and zeros are somehow essential to the concept of a computer. What is actually essential is the instruction set. If we want to talk about computers thinking, the fundamental unit of thought are the operations that the designers of the CPU implemented in hardware and microcode. The nature of computing is such that we're always building larger abstractions on top of more fundamental ones. The way to approach machine language or assembly language, in my opinion, is to think of them in terms of the operations supported by the hardware you're using, because those are the operations you're going to be manipulating, combining, and abstracting on top of. In future weeks, we're going to actually go through the beginning of the Elements of Computing Systems book and start building the Hack CPU piece by piece. The book itself is marvelous, covering not only hardware, but assembler design, the idea of virtual machines, compiler design and implementation, the creation of higher level programming languages, and writing programs in those languages. I hope you'll follow along. This has been programming like it's 1979. Thanks for watching.